Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, everyone, depending on your time zone. <laughs> Welcome to the sixth session of our uh, online conference series on the archaeology of Arabian Peninsula, organized in the framework of the Arua Lectures series. I am uh, Pia Majorano, and I'm happy to be leading this with my colleague, uh, Abdallah, Dr. Abdallah Arsharek. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, our uh, esteemed speaker, Fausto Mauro, who will deliver uh, today's lecture on Samad period in Oman. Fausto earned his master's degree in Near Eastern Archaeology at the University of Naples, L'Orientale, and his thesis focused on the chronological debate of the late Iron Age in Oman and the United Arab Emirates. Engaging with various international archaeological projects in the Sultanate of Oman, he actively contributed to research in sites uh, such as Diba, uh, Bima, and other sites along the Batinat coast in northern Oman. His expertise also extended to rescue archaeology, as he worked as a senior archaeologist on construction sites in Rome, in the municipality of Rome, and in Baden-Württemberg. But currently, Fausto is a PhD student at the, uh, at the Heidelberg University, under the guidance of Professor um, Stephanie Dopper. And um, his doctoral research was funded by the Gerda Enkel Foundation, and it aims to deepen our understanding on this specific um, period, the summer late Iron Age, ranging more or less between 300 BC and 300 C. He will talk about this and identify potential new areas of occupation in Oman. Uh, let's give Fausto a warm welcome. And yeah, I leave the word to the, our speaker. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good, good evening, good night. I hope at the end, maybe. <laughs> and thank you very much for uh, having inv invited me to give this lecture to uh, Dr. Majorano and Dr. Abdullah. It's my pleasure to uh, speak about the Samal Iron Age in Oman. Of course, uh, we cannot ex exclude also some sites for the United Arab Emirates. And at the beginning, when uh, actually Pia invited me, we agreed on uh, giving a, um, a general overview with this lecture because there are both uh, enthusiasts and both scholars, uh, I hope, attending this lecture. And from one side, even though it, some scholars may, may not be, of course, uh, um, um, working deeply uh, during uh, about uh, working on uh, this period. It happened quite a lot with some probability that, of course, you might stumble upon some some later age findings. And I I know that you all uh, are very disappointed when I don't know when you are going to excavate any Bronze Age tombs and you find any some other use in it and you say, oh, please not again. But <laughs> that's that's absolutely part of the um, Oman uh, and Southeastern Arabian archaeology, and it's very important also to um, well document also these reuses. But let's get started, and I hope you will enjoy this journey. And I hope my PowerPoint will work. Yes, <laughs> we tried. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a brief outline for um, this talk. Of course, I introduce a very brief, very short historical context. Uh, then we will move to the state of research and digital sources, both, uh, especially the digital sources. I will give you some um, tools uh, free on the net uh, that you can absolutely uh, access. Uh, um, we will discover then the, the sites map and we will, uh, of course, uh, go deeper into the topic, speaking about what's uh, some other later in age, and what are the others uh, chronological horizons in the area? And one of it is absolutely PEER, which is the abbreviation for Clésami Clésant from the, uh, of course, from, Fran from French, and the discovered and uh, um, uh, systematized by, by French teams working in UAE. We will go deeper in the, into the Samad later on age, speaking about architecture, speaking about common findings. I, I, I couldn't have, uh, I, I don't have enough time, of course, to speak about each single finding, each, each single categories. So I decided to show you some of the main uh, architecture, architectural features and some of the 
common findings as I uh, brought, uh, uh, which are actually, I'm doing a survey in Oman right now, and these three categories are one of the um, uh, most, uh, let's say, in a certain way, easily findings to find on the surface. Then we will speak about challenges because it's as every other period in the southeastern Arabia, it's it doesn't have any fixed um, beginning and end, and it doesn't have any fixed also um, much fixed many fixed points in it. So we will see what challenges we are facing uh, right now. And at the end, what's what's next? I will give you some maybe suggestion for where the the research should. Uh, uh, go for the future, and I will introduce my PhD project uh, about uh, the um, Tamil later on age in Oman. I will tell you more later. I create a little bit of suspense with these effects okay. going up. So we cannot, of course, rule out this guy here, even if legalized. It's Alexander the Great, of course, and it's where uh, our uh, uh, journey starts. Uh, uh, because uh, we we know that uh, we all know, of course, Alexander the Great's uh, uh, conquests, and we also know that he was very interested in this region here on both sides of the Gulf, both the Arabian shorelines and the Iranian ones. Uh, he was uh, his, I would say, dream was like to to install uh, what the um, the Phoenician were do were uh, yes we're doing on the eastern mediterranean so to create all this connection and trades uh, and also it was also a, a, um, an a, an ambitious plan also to avoid maybe all the difficulties that they might have encountered from uh, going from the mesopotamia from babylonia from susa to the uh, indus and uh, and far beyond so when they reached actually the Indus, Alexander the Great, he decided to go back to uh, Susa and then ba ba Babylon, yeah, also with uh, with his troop, but he uh, left part of his uh, troops, especially the fleet, of course, uh, in the hand of Nyarthus, and to um, investigate what, what were the the possibility also to, to create any uh, trade uh, outports along the this shoreline and later in the months, uh, yes, years, but even months, uh, other uh, ad ad admiral from the Macedonian uh, Seleucid uh, came along this this path and started also to to check the the, the Arabian shorelines. I'm speaking about Archias, Andrastosthenes, and Hieron. Let's see. I will give you just a very brief timeline because we all know these days, but it's also to to make the, the this this talk inside a, a framework, uh, we start from Alexander death, 300 to um, 23 BCE. Then we are in the middle of the Seleucid Empire that uh, tried to uh, keep this dream of Alexander's alive, and then from 323, which is, I, I beg your pardon, this. <laughs> As I wrote here, I took this uh, timeline from the, the Persian part of the Oriental Institute Museum, but uh, one of you might argue that, of course, the Seleucid Empire started a little bit earlier until the 247 BCE. Then, of course, we are in the middle of the Parthian Empire, uh, Empire and we are in the middle of what we are going to uh, talk about today as uh, in Southeast Arabia, but what was going on, especially during this uh, time span here. And of course, later after the Parthian Empire, Al-Rashid the first came and uh, um, defeated the uh, the last uh, uh, Parthian uh, ruler as um, Artabanus the fourth. But this is later for our talk. So in this timeline, we see that this uh, please remember also the color I've associated with that. So the red for the pier, the Prislamic Croissant, and the blue for Samad. The pier was uh, mostly um, is mostly uh, spread all over the United Arab Emirates and the northern parts of Oman, so the the non central and northern Baltic, I would say, and it has been uh, systematized over the the years uh, by the French mission and later by the Belgian mission. So at the beginning we had uh, a, um, four or five partition of the, the phases of the peer phases and uh, later with this um, paper published by 
uh, Bruno Overlay, the Belgian team uh, has made uh, have made new discoveries on course, and we uh, they are now speaking about early and early Mleha phase, which goes from the early mid century until the mid late first century BCE, which uh, group both A and B to an Adur phase from the mid late first century BCE to the early second century BCE, the old or the uh, Mouton chronology is Pier C. The late Mleha phase from early mid second century C to the mid third century C, uh, Pier D, also known as Pier D. And then, of course, the Xenian period, the post Mleha phase, the post late Iron Age phase, the, whatever you would like to call it. And so, as you could also see by uh, here, this, this table for the tie span, we have a um, pretty, let's say, sure. Uh, uh, limits for the chronologies because they found uh, many um, um, gu um, fossil guides and uh, uh, super diagnostic findings, especially coming from uh, um, all over the, 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 let's say, the world, the near, the, the yes, the Western Asia and the Mediterranean. While for the Samad Late Iron Age, well, uh, it's it's less studied as we are going to see. There are less research for the Samad Late Iron Age. Therefore, also the chronology is, I would say, pretty simple compared, of course, to peer, because we have this time span of around uh, uh, 500 century from the around circa 200 BC to 300 CE. This is the, the last um, update of the chronology, as I'm going to tell where, where it's going to appear soon, I hope. And so let's move a little bit along the state of research and some digital sources that you, I, I remind you, you would find for free on the web. All somehow all such. I took this uh, state of research as I would say simple and clear as possible. Of course, there are many papers that I left I left out, like for example some uh, British uh, expedition, for example. But so I wanted also to be within one hour <laughs> with this talk. Therefore, we start with the 70s, with Iraqi missions working in UAE at Malaya and at Dur. Afterwards, there was the, the first boom of uh, research in uh, UAE and in Oman, in UAE for, um, by uh, French uh, missions working in Malaya and also uh, in European consortium working in at Dur from um, Denmark, Scotland, England, UK, uh, French, and uh, uh, Belgium, of course. And so there was this first boom of excavation of sites in uh, all over the 80s on both the two major sites for the pier, as well as also for Oman. There were the first mission by the, the German team of the, the um, Deutsches Bergbau Museum, uh, led by Gerd Weisgeber, uh, where uh, our uh, Paul Duell here in the audience uh, worked quite a lot, and he also is one of the key experts of this period for the Samal later on age. Then we reached the 1992, when Michel Mouton defends his PhD thesis, uh, published later in uh, 2K8, La Peninsule Domaine de la Fin de l'Age du Fer, au début de la période Sassanide, which is one of the masterpieces, one of the book, must to have book. In the uh, literature, not only for the um, that that century, actually, of the um, not only for that century, but also for previous and a little bit later periods. Then, in two thousand one, two major books appeared: one by Ernie Herring, excavation, and other, of course, um, um, scholars that were working with him uh, in Edur, as uh, Belgian scholars, excavation at Edur, Omar Kai. Kaiwayan, Renate Darabemis, the tombs, and which, of course, cover and uh, publish um, on the excavation done at, in, in Adur, uh, speaking about the tombs. There was another, uh, of course, there was a volume one, which was about the glass vessels uh, um, written by White House. Then in the same year, 2001, uh, Paul Yule published his uh, habilitation uh, the Grebafeld in Samad of Shan Sultan Ottoman, Materialien zu einer Kulturgeschichte, where he published uh, the materials, uh, um, uh, the object, the findings uh, um, they found during the German missions in uh, Samad of Shan, in Central Oman, in Samad of Shan and Ilan Moyasa. 
Of course, there are many updates that happened during the last decades. Uh, one um, checkpoint for the state of research is for sure the 2014, when Polyol updates both the early Iron Age and later Iron Age in the book uh, Crossroads, early and later Iron Age, Southeastern Arabia, as well as Michel Mouton and Jeremy Chitkat did this, the same on, uh, but speaking about South and South and East Arabia in the desert margins. And so they, we have uh, after like almost somehow 15, 20 years, two huge updates for this period. And of course, from the uh, 2010s on, uh, many updates have been published, but also not just by Paul Yule as well, rising in some other age from 2016 towards uh, an identity of the Samad period population, uh, uh, but uh, also from the uh, Belgian teams uh, working in Leha. Uh, most of the reports actually published um, one uh, every year, uh, published in annual charge archaeology, which is also uh, free to find uh, on the Sharjah um, Antiquities website, and so we have almost an yearly up an yearly update of what's what's going what what's going on in Malaya by the Belgian teams. Of course, I'm as I say, I'm leaving um, I'm leaving out many other um, uh, sources, like for example, also uh, the 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 British uh, scholar Derek Kennett has done a, a huge contribution also to to this. Uh, uh, to this century, to these studies, so but uh, um, I mean, th these are anyway the, the most important uh, uh, checkpoints, uh, uh, published papers and books. Then we have something that is forthcoming, a, a book actually by Paul Yule and me at the Dawn of History, the late pre-Islamic age in Southeastern Arabia, which is going to appear with the um, thanks to the Ministry of Heritage and Tourism of the Sultanate Oman and the Archeo Press uh, um, editor. So I hope it's, it's coming out soon. Let's move to the digital sources. So um, something out of paper, I will say, because I would highly recommend you uh, these, some of these websites or blog where you could find some materials, some very important and useful materials for whatever purpose of your research. Uh, one is the Global Digital Heritage and GDH Africa um, um, page on, Ske on Sketchfab, where this uh, this company has uh, um, uploaded many uh, 3D models from all over the world, but especially from the Sharjah Emirates. And you could find here, I guess, all the findings it's, they are on display in the Malay Archaeological Center, uh, not, not, not just concerning the pier, of course, as you could see here, for example, but also all whatever they found in uh, in Malaya, in the Malaya area, but also findings from, from Dibal Hizn and from other side of, of sites from the Emirates. So this is a super useful source to, to use and to consult. And we have, of course, the Hide Icon pool of the Semitistic uh, uh, Department of the Heidelberg University uh, about Oman. Um, it's um, taken care of personally by Paul Yule, and you can find here photos of the sites around the oasis of the Samadoshan and Amaza, Almoyasa, photos of the annual field campaigns, drawings of findings, including pottery, photos and or published finds, including pottery, and much more. Uh, here you could see that, I mean, this is updated to um, 2019, but I guess we are over uh, 6,000 objects uploaded on this uh, uh, repository, which is super useful and it's pretty easy to to use. It's just you, you write whatever word you would like to search for and know the a plethora of images and documentation and useful um, sources uh, pop up. Then we have, of course, also the archeoman.de website, where, I mean, it's more about other periods probably, but about uh, um, the later on age, especially, you have this section here about Muhalia, and it's also a project le um, le le led by uh, the Tübingen University, where you could find all the, their work uh, recently done in Bath, in Al-Ain, in al Al-Hubeib, and in other sites, of course, Abu Zaid al Khajba. Uh, the Mudebi Regional Survey, the Umwelt Vandal Project, and Mahalia or Muhalia, um, where I used actually this later. This all sources, I used it them for building this presentation. So it's also somehow uh, pay credits also. 
And of course, the last addition to these tools is uh, absolutely the Ancient Arabia uh, website uh, the, that was launched as part of the French National Research Agency Research Project Map Arabia. And it is devoted to the study of the Arabian Peninsula through that analysis and mapping of the Turidula, historical and cultural dynamics all over the Arabia, not just Southeastern Arabia. And here, especially, there, there are some last addition about the Southeastern Arabia and also about the Somali Darunage and peer into the thematic dictionary of ancient Arabia. This is another super useful source for studying, not just, as I said, this period. So let's let's go through the meats of the of the talk, uh, starting speaking about a sites map, where the sites lies actually. Uh, here, it's of course a map of Southeastern Arabia, and you see here that there are some colored dots. Uh, yes, I will start first speaking with the red one, which, as I told you before, it's associated with with the with the pier in this presentation. And as you can see, they are mostly spread all over the North Batina and the UAE, and uh, also the Muzandam uh, Peninsula. And we have three major sites. Of course, there are more, but these three are the major sites, so all the, the sites that have on which scholars have built chronologies, especially uh, Edur here on the coast on the Uma Parwain um, Emirates and Malheya in the Sharjah Emirates, but also Diba. And I don't have enough time to speak about Diba, there, that's why I inserted here some useful. Uh, reference where you could find more about Dib, at least the, the Dibba for the early Iron Age, later Iron Age, the peer, period, the grave goods from the long chamber tomb, Dibba 761, Fujaira, a first inventory by Pellegrino, Yesposi, Buddha, Tayamonte, and us, and uh, Ali Hassan. And also the la one of the previous lecture for Ordua Arwa Association by Francesco Genki, working actively at uh, Dabal Baya Necropolis in the uh, in the Muzandam parts of the uh, Diba, um, in, in Diba actually. So I recommend you to watch also this um, previous lecture by Francesco Genki. Speaking about Samadoshan, the main uh, the the main site Samad later on age coming the, the name comes of course from the the eponymous site Samadoshan, which is. Uh, next to another very important site, namely Al Moyasa, uh, yes, Al Moyasa, and it's lay it lays in the middle, of course, of central Oman, and it's uh, it's it's the site that the German team has created since the eighties, and I'm not speaking about talking about the trillions on monuments of southeastern Arabia, and I remind you that there was there is a previous Arwa Association lecture always in this frame of lecture about Arabia um, done by Roman Garba, it's easily accessible on YouTube. So let's move to uh, speak about the main feature of the pre-Islamic Khoisan period. We, we have a kind of urbanoid settlements. We have temples like the one in the background from the area M of Adur, the temple devoted, dedicated to Shamash. We have uh, fortresses, we have fort, and especially here on the right, we have complex buildings, we have complex architecture. Here on the right, this rotating building is the fortress in the area CW of Mleha, which has a squarish shape. It's around uh, 60 times 65 meters, and this constructed of mud bricks and stone uh, for the foundation. It has it shows eight towers externally with just one single access here on this eastern side, and uh, they there are all these um, uh, rooms uh, around the courtyard. Which, I mean, uh, the 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 the, the, um, the purpose of the building, the, the function of the building is not uh, clear yet, but it could have been done something uh, related with the, with the, with the mark with some market or even. A, a local re a residence of uh, some local ruler as um, but anyway it was a, a very important center for power for local power because actually three coin molds has been found inside this building and it's pretty uh, rare to find such findings where i'll show you later what i'm talking about then we have the another kind of complex architecture for the for the funerary architecture this is uh, the tomb of uh, the Amud, 
uh, FA5 found uh, and is carried by the Belgian team at Muleha. And uh, this uh, tomb is pretty important because it from here it came uh, the inscription of Amud, uh, inspector of uh, um, King of Oman. It's it's written this uh, inscription, and also very important uh, findings that have allowed the Belgian team to uh, made some changes in the chronology and in uh, our uh, knowledge about the peer, uh, especially from so, for uh, some findings uh, for Rodian and for a handle which are clearly um, datable and yes, I would say super diagnostic and. Uh, another uh, very important find was the an amphora with the uh, Blake uh, thick Blake glaze, which is also uh, pre. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's it's a unicum in the region. So this is also a, a very important discovery for the peer chronology. Moving to touching some other aspects uh, here, you see the the inscription uh, as I, as I said for the inspector of the king of Oman, Amund found in the the tomb we have seen before, the coin molds found at um, the fort CW, was the fort we have seen already before, and the sites on the pier side, they are super involved in uh, international, I will say trade, uh, that's one of the main difference with Samad, as we are going to see soon, and we had um, uh, Parthian pottery jars like this one have been found in a uh, a good quantity, as well as here the black glazed Rodian amphora. So we have uh, imports, of course, from the Western Asia. Uh, Western Asia. We have imports from the Mediterranean. Uh, not just these, of course. We have also imports from other uh, parts of the world. In uh, speaking about glass artifacts, this bottle here, in particularly, come from Diba al Hizn. And this is also something that is missing in Samad, um, Samad sites, glass artifacts, we are going to see soon. And to um, go deeper into, yes, to, to, to know more about this, <laughs> I advertise here one more Arwa Association previous lecture by Professor Derek Kenneth from Durham University between the Iron Age and the rise of Islam. Developments in Eastern Arabia from the fourth century BC to the seventh century with BC, uh, sorry AD, which is centered, of course, on Eastern Arabia uh, until the the UAE, and so he also um, uh, said more also about the the, the later period, the Sasanian period. Uh, let's go through the Samal later in Asia. In the background, you see the one of the most important settlement, uh, the Jabal Al Sunsuna, which is. Here you can see, I think I even made it too small, this map. And there are some features that are uh, particular for the uh, Samal later on age uh, um, settlement architecture, like here you could see also from here. They are mostly, some of them are fortified settlements and they feature um, these casemat walls all, al all along the, the perimeter, which is something peculiar for this period. And um, many of them are also compact settlements, so uh, nucleated uh, around something. While we have also some semi-compact they, they settlements, like this one at Bandar Gisa, it's on the coast not far from Muscat, which uh, had has no uh, no fortification. For example, and there are just complex of houses, compound of houses scattered around. Uh, yes, one more uh, peculiarity, as I said, is the casemate walls running along the fortification. And after the last uh, working season by Paul Yule's team, uh, they they published actually the report on the Academia page of Paul Yule's. They found they mapped Jebel Sunsuna this site here in the background, and they feature uh, the the site features seventy one structures, mostly single room houses. All are built using the sandwich technique with heavy stones on the outside and gravel filling. The entrances are not uniformly positioned. So some, some research actually is adding um, in interesting information about this period. Uh, in contrast to the pier, we have far less use of mud brick compared both to the pier and the earlier on age. This is a fact for some outsides. 
And also, I mean, this is a fact for many sites for many periods in region. The sites are typical position and homogeneously along wadi banks or hilltops in close proximity to wadis. This is um, almost like uh, stating the obvious, but it's still something that it's important to to underline for this period. Moving to the grave architecture, well, uh, we actually recently have uh, with with Paul Jule, we have actually some kind of more than twenty some later on age types of graveyards of graves, sorry. And I want to show you just three types because sometimes it's not that easy to spot them on the ground because sometimes, as you could see here, it's just a line of stones um, on the ground, and then something excavating it. You see all the, um, the, 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 the burial, the, the grave pit actually covered and sealed with stones and with this line of stones um, showing up here, it's so-called bar walls. So you see here the 37, it's the same tomb, but the 37 here on this stone and the 37 here on this stone as well. And then of course, by excavating it, you find the, the depositional layer. And I mean, that's, some are also lucky in these guys because it's it's since it's very difficult to spot and it's uh, highly uh, likely that you find the, the complete burial without any later disturbance. This also is a, is a tricky type. I mean, at least to, to spot on the ground, uh, it's a, a, the type of Amkat, which is a site here. Uh, it's just, I mean, some... I mean, probably uh, not just looking at this small picture, but being on the on the... On the surface on the ground, it's maybe easy to to see. It's just a stone arrangement, stone alignment. It's a stone anomalies that, of course, when they excavated, actually, Paul Jules' mission excavated, they found a simple, very yeah, a very simple uh, pit with all the the, the burial. And then uh, uh, last in this um, this talk, at least the one of the Mahalia type, which is a site not far from the Samadho Shane Ramoya circle here of Mahalia. Uh, we have this kind of uh, kind of structure that are um, peculiar with this stone um, circle of stones around. Here is a complete, of course, but imagine a whole circle of stone, as you could see here. And then only by, of course, digging, you could see more the structure, the the pit uh, sealed with these bar walls here. And this last picture is taken from the archimandotte website. Here is the complete excavated uh, tomb at the end. It's, it's not the same tomb here. Eh? It's just uh, to give some visual examples of what looks like, because sometimes the, the documentation of tombs is a little bit spotty sometimes. So here is a representative visual, represent, uh, yeah, visual representation of ideal Mahalia uh, type of tombs, as you could see here. And this is pretty, I would say, um, spread, at least in central Oman, this type of tombs. So it's quite difficult to see uh, some, sometimes see some other tombs on the uh, on surface, as in this case, for example. And it's also not that easy to find the findings on surface, as you would guess, uh, since they are uh, sealed the tombs underground, so the the findings likely on uh, on one hand, of course, they are still in situ uh, in the in the burial. So uh, the pottery I took actually this from the thematic dictionary of ancient Arabia, the one of the last voice added by Benoit and Yule. I adapted something uh, to make it fit with this talk. Uh, we have most of the Samal later on age pottery is handmade and it's uh, predominantly closed in forms are found in graves like neck jars, bottle jugs and so on. The Some of the common fabrics uh, feature light colored soft with a mineral temper, mostly serpentinite. Some have a fine orange to reddish slip with brushing traces. And uh, also some, of, so as we'll see later, of course, some of the uh, the fabrics of the wear are that easy to uh, recognize as Samad on first sight, but you need more, uh, you need, of course, more uh, um, to, 
to, to tell it. The, the decorations, on the other hand, are pretty are sometimes pretty fixed for some later in age, as in this case, of course, some jars, bottles, or jugs uh, feature pre filing size or impressed decoration, including short herringbone monograms, which is super peculiar for later in age, I would say impressions, uh, kind of impressions, and wavy lines, which especially on this open bowl here, it's um, one of the, I would say, most diagnostic shape and decoration. Uh, in this case, uh, for the open bowl, for the Saman later on age. Painted, this is very important, painted decoration is rare in this period. I don't know why, maybe they, they didn't like painting on pottery, they say, okay, impressions are enough. <laughs> And uh, some other peculiarity of this period, Albal Samaria, of course, mainly uh, coming from a funerary uh, context, and they are well made in dark, minimally temperate, soft fabric. Sometimes they feature sleep, sometimes they have also decoration, as you could see, uh, yeah, painted decoration, as you could see here. Moving along the common findings, here we have one of the uh, actually, one of the most common findings, uh, uh, if you go some survey around, but also by excavating, of course, tombs for uses as well. Um, and here we have a comparison. I show you a comparison between the uh, Michel Newton classification of iron arrowheads and um, yeah, uh, Paul Euler's classification of iron arrowheads from southeastern Arabia. I mean, the one on the left is built on the Malaya and UAE findings mostly, while the one on the right is mostly based on the uh, Central Oman and the uh, Samad and findings, but with some, of course, addition from the uh, peer side. So there are actually many of them made of iron, uh, besides this one here, which could also be some heirlooms from the previous periods. Due to, to corrosion, of course, the precise shapes and the original weights of iron and weights are challenging to determine. And going the, through the typologies, we have the um, typology A, the Michel Newton A, which are uh, arrowheads with a measure point near to the distal point, as in this case, they are similar to the class 14, Yules class 14. Then we have the um, group B by Mouton's classification with the straight parallel edges and no pronounced measure point, which is uh, contemporary to the um, group A. And it's it has some comparison with class 12 of Jules classification. We have the class C of Mouton's, which is uh, uh, arrowheads with a measure point near the base or overlapping the proximal point. These have been found in both the F necropolis from where the, the famous Amud tomb in, Mal in Malaya has been found in the same area, area F, and also Adur, uh, dating from the last century BCE to the first century CE. And I guess, yes, we have comparison, of course, with class 11. And I guess we have also some comparison with the background from the grave uh, for, um, uh, from the site Amla Fuaida 2, the grave 2. Then we have uh, the class D from Mouton with ROS with a measure point near the, the, the middle, which gives them a leaf shape appearance, which has, of course, comparison with Yule's classification. And also the class E by Michel Mouton, which are um, where the, the, the base actually blends with the tank. And they have also some corrective in the 17 class by uh, Polio. So, we have some overlapping classes, at least for iron hydrowets, but there are, of course, other differences. There are other points that are not uh, shown, uh, um, at least there aren't uh, close, very close comparison from one um, horizon to the other, with the other. Then we move to the iron weapons, uh, as uh, the swords in this case, which are usual, uh, which are also uh, pretty uh, diagnostic. They uh, yeah, they all come from uh, Arabia, from funerary context, and we have this uh, table here uh, taken from um, Al Jawari uh, et al. book, the, the, the book about Ahud uh, Horde, published in 2021. And we have some of the 
uh, most uh, common words found in uh, in graves, plus some example, some addition from Maleha, so also from the peer side. Um, most of these words are uh, double aged, like this one, and they are, I guess, 39 uh, double aged words, so they're absolutely more double aged than single aged words. Some notable types are like this one, the, cla uh, the, yeah, the, um, the class S5, as you could also see from the background, this background is actually the a case on display at the Bizia and Salud Visitor Center, excavated from Salud SLP Graveyard, the admission uh, led by Michele de Gesposti. And I highly recommend you, if you have never been there yet, to visit this uh, wonderful uh, museum, visitor center, and the whole uh, Salud site in Oman, if you've never been there yet. And so let's move then another peculiar Plus is the S7, as you can see here, it's iron shore single age in this case, straight blades with solid uh, blade backs. And very uh, curious and peculiar is also this one with the disc, the, um, disc pommel shape, as you could see also in other types. But um, another um, pretty common um, handle type, grip type is this uh, eagle uh, head or beak uh, type like you can see here, here, and also uh, pronounced here. So that, that was for the uh, swords. Uh, and other common findings or very distinctive uh, findings for the bosom and later on age and the uh, pier are the stone vessels, as you can see here. Uh, this one on the left is classification uh, by Michel Mouton, which is, yes, a, yes, they follow a chronological order. So from the uh, 3rd century BC to the later uh, peer periods. And this on the right is a sample from Paul's use of classification. It's, it's not all in here. And so stone vessels uh, um, have been discovered made of soapstone, chloride, or steatite. And alabaster, or as you, the one, uh, alabaster, or more generally calcite, as you could see this example here in the background. And um, the shapes differ from early production and they decoration also distinct. We have early Iron Age or also late Bronze Age, soft stone, uh, soft, uh, yeah, soft stone, stone vessels, uh, very uh, decorated, uh, very, yeah, very fine decorated, I would say, while here it's very simple. I, I would call it an, a minimal style. Maybe they were just too lazy, but they're, they are made on a lathe. So there is this kind of technology was used uh, during the, the Samad later on age. And uh, the, the, yeah, uh, Michel Mouton here on the left distinguished parameters are uh, include shapes uh, of dream and decoration of the external world. We have this example here, which is pretty common for the um, late century BC, early, uh, yes, peer A, I would say. This is pretty common for this kind of, this century. Then we have later uh, example like this one uh, with these horizontal lines. And also this example here, which it's it comes from uh, an unknown context. We just know that it comes from the uh, Mahut Albus, which is a region with a little bit of creativity. You would imagine that it's laying here on the map. I'm sorry for that. And as I said, we have also our buster and calcite vessels, like this example here, which uh, of course primarily originate from funerary context, but this one uh, together with other uh, Vessels um, similar to this one have been discovered in MLH 10, uh, area 10 of um, Malaya site in the in the Emirates near the building H uh, in the area H. Yes, the, um, the repertoire of this kind of uh, calcite and alabaster vessels includes beehive shaped vessels, balsamaria composite vessels, and leads that are either simple, like also that yeah, this is also calcite or have lion shape uh, um, lion shape handles, which I hope yeah, yeah, you, you probably have seen those around. They're pretty uh, distinctive also for this period. So how 
What are the challenges? How to distinguish between uh, peer and Samad? Well, that's that's uh, um, it's not that easy sometimes because, of course, there are some sites lying in the middle of some sites that, as you are going to see, they just have um, like th these these green spots here. The rule sites that they belong to uh, what with polyol we recently called uh, uh, near. Uh, so some unlaid iron age near, non some unlaid iron age, uncertain sites are sites that, yes, they belong to the same chronological time frame, but we could not say yet with um, absolutely certainty that they belong to the one or to the other um, chronological horizon. Uh, therefore, there are challenges in attribution and sometimes single findings uh, coming from unknown context, like as you see in the, the, the the, the soft stone, um, the soft stone vessel before coming from Mahout area. We have, uh, of course, some rescue excavations uh, where they have been found some single tombs or burials, and uh, of course, for the different time of uh, uh, commercial archaeology for rescue archaeology, the, the reports um, are um, published right after the excavation, so uh, uh, parts of deep studying of the Findings is sometimes missing, but uh, I don't blame any. I don't blame anybody. As I, I've been working also in the rescue or excavation sector, so I know perfectly the the crazy times and the deadlines that there are uh, uh, in this kind of sector. So I'm, I'm, with it, I'm not trying to blame anybody. I want to to state that to be clear. And we have, of course, many sites have only been survived, especially in the Samad area, in central and eastern Oman, have only been survived. So. Uh, excavations are missing and all the data that an excavation bring and sometimes it's as i uh, anticipated before it's not that easy to distinguish between earlier age and later age settlements at first sight but because pottery fabrics and shapes sometimes overlap so it's it's there's still uh, much to do about um, pottery pottery study for the later Iron Age and also for the later century of the early Iron Age, which is, of course, as you might guess, the, the previous period, the period before the later Iron Age. And then we have, as I already told you, some sites in, in central Oman with closer comparison uh, with uh, the peer area, like, for example, Salut, uh, as um, yeah, you see here in the background, this uh, bronze uh, bowls with um, horse-shaped spout coming from Salut, which is um, yeah, it's it's an object actually found uh, in both Pira and Samad context, especially for this uh, horse-shaped spout, also from uh, southern Oman as well. But anyway, there are some sites that have findings that belong to, to both chronologies. So what to do with them? <laughs> and of course. Somebody reading some of the, the papers about the chronological bit might think that, okay, it's just, I, I, I shut my eyes, I just pick, okay, this side belongs to this and this side belongs to that. But there is, of course, some uh, thoughts behind attribution and there are, as you see, some ch challenges here, but there are, of course, more challenges in site attribution. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not math, of course, as like for other... Um, periods of the southeastern Arabia and other parts of the world, of course. So I'm giving now some suggestion or what I think that could be done in the future to uh, enhance the, the chronology and study and uh, the reliability of this um, Samad later on age and peer as well. Of course, Samad needs more. <laughs> Uh, of course, we need more C14 stable isotope analysis to enhance dating accuracy and validate theories. Um, we miss C14 uh, uh, data from some other later on age sites, and some of them are uh, skewed or are not reliable. Some of them coming from uh, from graves, of course, for the um, yes, they 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 give. Um, some sometimes skewed results and they don't match with the actual findings from the grace. Yes, uh, previously unpublished objects should be uh, recovered from ministry store, from uh, 
scholars from uh, whoever uh, and to in order to properly insert them into the chronologies because there are of course things I'm still unpublishing things that are there and wait for somebody to be to to see the the light of the sun and be published and to see yeah <laughs> stating the obvious need for new research need for new especially excavation for the Samad sites and investigate site location as you have seen so far we have a good amount of sites location we know uh, a good amount of sites and um, many of them we know at uh, very precisely where they lay, of where they yes where they are of course at, at the seconds and uh, yes Pia ah, it's forty nine okay yes I still have five minutes the last slide it's I'm, okay I'm, it's okay go I'm ahead almost, <laughs> I'm almost there and yeah I'm investigating site location geospatial analysis and all these settlement patterns and this is actually a Cicero Prodomo Sua because that's what I'm doing right now with my um, PhD project, uh, Resilience and Adaptability during the Samad later on age, Jebel Madar is a case of study. I um, focus on this area here in the Sharkia, Sharkia North uh, Governorate, which lays here in Central Oman, and here, of course, in Southeastern Arabia. And my main uh, um, question that I would like to, to test to, to see what, where, it, where does it lead is that many of the sites are lying along this Wadi Andam, Wadi Mahram, like Mahalia is one of the central hub of the Samad later on age. And of course here as well, Samad of Shan and Al Moyasar are here, which is the one, second central hub of the Samad later on age. And starting from the results of uh, the Al Mudebi regional survey conducted by uh, Professor uh, Stephanie Dopa, uh, who actually didn't find much evidence of the Samad later on age in this area, in the Mudebi area. i very curious to see what happened in the area south, uh, towards south. And so we, we knew some sites here. We st were still along the Wadi Andam going, uh, flowing here and the Wadi Al-Lithal here. Two different uh, landscape. Uh, one is, of course, um, a uh, yes, uh, a wadi which has still um, a, a, a good flow stream uh, along uh, this part here, and here is an alluvial fan, which is of course a different kind of environment. So I would like to here just show you the research question. I'm, I'm almost finishing. Did Samad community also settle around the Jebel Madar, which is the mountain here, or they just stay here? And why they avoided this area here? Actually. Uh, how did the central hubs, so Mahalia and Samad Oshan actually, namely, um, interact with this area here, with this, uh, if I will find any sites, of course. <laughs> and the third research question is, how did Samad groups navigate changes? What factors underpin the assessment choices? We have seen differences with earlier on age. We have seen also differences in um, funerary customs. We move from above ground tombs to the underground tombs to pits. So this is also a big change in the in the chronology, and to do that, I'll be um, guide. I, I, to do that, yeah, I will do. I'm actually I'm already doing a um, uh, field survey in this area, guided by both remote sensing and archaeological predictive model. And I'm very glad to announce that uh, it's a news of the last few days that Professor uh, Philip Fehangen from Amsterdam University, one of the key experts of predictive model among other things, and geospatial analysis has joined uh, this project as co-supervisor. And together with uh, Professor Stephanie Doper, I'm sure I have uh, one of the best choice of supervisors I uh, could have had. And so now it's all on me. Thank you very much for your uh, patience. I hope you have kept it up so far. And I leave the floor to the Q&A session. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Fausto, for this insightful talk. Actually, I've got the chance to to hear a lot on Samad, and you know I'm I'm pretty far from this chronological period. It was really interesting, and uh, yeah, as uh, Fausto already said, and also Abdallah wrote in the chat, the floor is open for the Q and A session. You